Hey everybody, this is Mario Dennis with the Keeping It Real Estate Podcast. And today, my guest, my good friend, Mohamed Carbacion. First of all, you have to correct me. How do you pronounce your last name properly? Well, like, uh, the good thing is that any way that you pronounce it, because I'm from another country, so it's going to be right in America. So you can say Carbacion, you can say Carbacion, you can say Kardashian. <laughs> <laughs> we won't say Kardashian. We won't say Kardashian. Even though maybe that works for Bait Click, you know, podcast with yeah. Kardashian. You know, the first time that I got uh, my real estate license, so I was thinking about, because right now I am at my uh, the stage of immigration that I'm changing from green card to citizenship. So Correct. And I have the option to change my last name. Yes. And I was talking to Mila, my fiance, that, hey, baby, what do you think if I change my name to Kardashian instead of Kardashian? And <laughs> then maybe it's going to help my real estate business also. You know, I'm going to put billboards like more Kar- Kardashian. Yeah, work with Kardashian, right? Work with Kardashians, yes. Um, it, it's funny you mentioned that. So when I became a citizen, um, so my name is Mario Denny. So that's That was my birth name. And then we use a second last name yep. in South America, the mother, mother's last name, but that doesn't get used in the United States. Mm-hmm. So in that stage that I could change my name, I added my dad who had passed away. So I added his first name as my middle name. So now Mario Jose Denny, legally that's my name, but that's, people think that was my the name that I was born as and it's not i added that my my whole family was like what you change your name and i'm like i mean why not you could and it's still short for uh, coming from uh, yeah it's not like mario jose Denis hernandez gonzalez exactly it's still like three words yes um how does it work because you're from iran originally right do you guys just do the one last name or do you do two last names or how does that work as far as i remember no, uh, we just do one first name, one last name, and uh, we don't have so much middle name going mm-hmm. on, but um, that's about it. Yeah. Pretty cool. Um, so you are a real estate agent? Uh, since 2019, actually. I got my license 2019. Very good. And tell me a little bit about your company and what you do. So um, do you like to know about what I did so far in America or not? Yes, since sure. Florida. No, 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 no. Just go okay. back. So it's, it's only six years, so it's not... Yeah, seven. Seven, right. Yeah. So the story uh, starts when I moved to America seven years ago, which I was actually living in Dubai before that. Because I, at the age of 30, I started immigrating out of my country. I said, you know what? I want to go out, live somewhere else. And so I moved to Dubai. That was the easiest choice. Mm-hmm. All I had to do is applying for a university in Dubai and just get admitted, go there and live there, and then try to change your visa from work visa to from student visa to work visa. Right. Uh, after two years, I got an opportunity, great opportunity to move to America. So I moved to America and... Uh, Mm, I started uh, just interviewing for anything entry level position. So I was just Googling on the Craigslist entry level positions and I go, going through the list and just calling everybody. Entry level from a Starbucks, <laughs> entry level from. I, I have interviewed all of these companies. Yes. Until uh, another, uh, one company who was like a sales company, they hired me as an entry level sales and marketing position. And what they did was um, they were importing stuff from China or other countries, but mostly China. Um, and then they sell them inside like a big grocery, a big, uh, big box retail stores like Costco, Sam's Club, all of these big gotcha. box retailers. Yeah. And we used to sell them as a roadshow. It's like, like having a kiosk in the middle of the Costco. Yeah, like the sampling yeah, kiosk. Yeah, exactly, yes. exactly. And then uh, so we used to just like grab people from the aisles with any technique that we can and just like, and people were walking so fast. So yeah. we have to do crazy stuff to just stop them and right. have them like, oh my God, have you seen this? And just this kind of, uh, you know, crazy stuff. And I had the... Uh, like, uh, I still have an accent, but my accent was way thicker right back then. So... Yes. For me, it was easier to stop people with the accent. Right, because people are like, it sounds yeah. different. So yeah. they're like, wait, what? Exactly. So people were like, and I was having always fun and uh, I was having a good time, actually. The job was not easy, standing in the middle of the Costco and Sam's Club for 12 hours a day from uh, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. But uh, we, we made it fun. Mm-hmm. So we were selling stuff and uh, after three, three and a half years, 
that I was getting promoted to like all these levels of management and stuff and I wasn't on the field anymore and I was just managing the back office I decided that I want to pursue another thing rather than sales so uh, I talked to the owner of that company luckily the owner was investing there in uh, all of their profit into real estate in Florida mm-hmm. and buying properties for rent so I said yeah if you want to move to Florida I can have you get involved with my real estate I said of course Back then, I was What state were you in at the time? California, city of LA. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I uh, put all of my belongings because I was just immigrated to America, so I wasn't having like a, such a heavy life. Yeah, your, your life fit in a suitcase. Fit in in a, in a Kia Soul. Yeah. You know those key box Kias? Yes. You know, like, so my life fit in a Kia Soul with all this paperwork of the business and everything, and I drove from California all the way to Florida. Such a nice drive. It was just me, single, alone. And uh, I stopped in uh, Phoenix. I stopped in Houston. I stopped in El Paso. Mm -hmm. And then I stopped in somewhere in Pensacola. And then the last stop was uh, Tampa. I moved to Tampa, actually, back then. And I started working with this company. It was a great opportunity. They teach me everything from start to the finish of real estate investment on single-family houses, such as how to find the deals, uh, either in the auction wholesalers, how to buy them, how to do the renovation, find the tenant, and uh, also the pro- property management side. We were doing the property management ourselves for the company, dealing with uh, 250 tenants. Oh, wow. You know, uh, collecting the rent, ren- uh, doing the evictions, everything, good and bad together so it sounds like a, a bit of a headache 250 yes tenants. yes yes and especially when it gets closer to christmas and new year yeah you know people they have uh, other uh, kind of expenses that they added and they don't take the rent so seriously yes and uh, you know you don't want to also be such a uh, you know hard person on the one the christmas sure i remember once uh, i talked to one of the tenants on the phone and we were already under the pressure. It was uh, end of December, and uh, I was talking to this person. I said, hey, your rent is back. You're behind. You didn't pay the December rent. And uh, I'm trying to just not to send your case to the attorney, to our attorney for the eviction. Why don't you just work with me and let me know which day you can pay? And said, well, I used the money for Christmas gift for my baby. What do you want me to do? I said, like, well, I would recommend you to just uh, keep the ceiling on the, keep the roof on the top of the baby yeah. first yes. rather than yes. buying the Christmas gift. I understand. But, and he was so pissed off by my comment. I said, Yo, you don't understand, bro. You don't have kids, right? I said, no, I don't have kids, unfortunately. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah you know. it's just funny, right? Like, that is obviously the most important thing. It's yeah. like keeping a roof over your head. I mean, that's, primary base need like you have to have a place to lay your head and comes the holiday times it it really takes a back seat listen i've i've had um rentals since for 14 years 15 years now Mm -hmm. and not 250 generally i'll have between three and 10 tenants per year that's kind of like um that's been my number and uh but yeah it's funny the holidays come around and it's suddenly you know, the tickle me Elmo becomes more important than paying rent. And I'm like, Jesus, how? What? Like, what? Yes. For me, it's, it's so hard to understand how it works. But priorities changes uh, through the holidays. And uh, unfortunately, people, sometimes they put uh, holiday gifts and vacations over the rent. Yeah, I think that's probably a, a good a good stopping point in the sense that when you migrate from another country and you come from places where like people sometimes don't understand like how i grew up like you saved up enough money to be able to buy a house cash because there was no such a thing as a credit system for you to be able to purchase a home so having a home was like um, a huge source of pride but also a very rare thing like i don't know what home ownership was like in venezuela in the 90s my guess is probably 30 percent or under Mm -hmm. 40 percent or under um, and you know, so you come to the United States and the fact that sometimes you see that people that, that think that Christmas presents take precedent over, you know, paying rent is just crazy. Also because back home, if you don't pay rent, you're out. Like there's no conversation taking place. Like, Hey, let me know if you can make it in the next two weeks. I'll give you a month to catch up. Like, it's like, Oh, you didn't pay rent. You're out. I got three other people waiting yes, for it. There are not so many like a 
policies the government policies supporting the tenants mostly they mm. mostly support whoever has the more money and whoever right. has the most power so sometimes even uh, back here back in my country i know sometimes you can even have uh, authority to just cut the utilities off and do this crazy stuff you know yeah. that here you're not allowed to cut the utilities even if uh, they don't pay pay for it oh yeah or opening the door that's a hilarious one exactly like you can't t- you can't open the door and it's funny because i've sold a lot of investment property over the years to you know people from overseas and when they find themselves in a situation of confrontation with a tenant they're like well just just go in and change the locks and i'm like no no, it doesn't work like this no no no, that's not how it works here we're gonna we're gonna try to keep you out of trouble we're gonna have an attorney you know counsel you but that's not the way we're gonna do it yeah but the the good part was after uh we acquired all of these properties for that company so they started changing their uh strategy from rental to flips so they didn't want to buy and hold anymore they they wanted to just keep whatever they have and we started to doing flipping houses and that's why that's when uh, when I actually first started my flips, mm-hmm. flip experiences. It was totally different experience than doing the renovation for the rentals. I have done like by that time, I, I would have done, I think I was at 300 rental property renovations, full got. Buying them from the auction, full got mm-hmm. renovation. But um, the first five flips that I did was big challenge it was totally different story than all these renovations that i have done then i came to this inspection report and i said oh my god now we have to do everything right <laughs> now somebody is <laughs> yes. watching us <laughs> yes yes it's a different ball game for sure different ball game so it was great experience that we stopped started doing that and then um after after a year that I, I was doing the flips with this company i started venturing out on my own i was an employee of that company uh, I was so fortunate they were paying me so like a high amount f- for doing all of this but still I was always mm, because the higher the paycheck goes un, uh, you know, unlike the people that they are going to get so excited when their paycheck is high I was the highest paid person at some point at that company and then I was getting more scared than scared because yes. I don't you know the higher the paycheck goes the more risk has for yeah, you higher risk more responsibility more responsibilities yeah. and uh i'm not such a fan of it so i said you know what i have to f- start venturing out because if somebody pays you in a company for example two hundred thousand dollars a year you on your own you can make double that money mm-hmm. that's why they pay you this much that's an interesting you, you, I, I haven't seen anyone put it in those terms but that's a very interesting way to put it if someone is willing to pay you x amount of dollars to do something you're probably leaving money on the table versus doing yeah. it on your own so the value that i bring to these people it's enough to pay you that and then they oh, make a profit yeah yeah so i started venturing out uh, it was just january 2018 that um i was a still employee of that company and i started l- l- seeking out to different investors uh, my first person that I called was uh, I was on my Instagram and I went to my uh, my Instagram page. I saw my landscaper um, tagged me on one of the posts and I knew the, this landscaper was working with me or like for a lot of project. And I saw the post. And, oh, Mo, look at this project. And like, how do you like it? We, we just did it. And I see yeah, it's a cool job. But I see he said the same thing for a couple of other people also. So I said, like, you know what? Let me go and see who are these people. Because if I'm doing this pre- this these many projects with him, they should have do, done the same. Right. So I reached out to one of them was uh, Wael uh, Wael Georgi. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know him or not. He's I a, don't. He's a broker and the owner of the properties in town. Okay. And he has an office in uh, Hunters Creek, and he has now he just opened another office in downtown. So I. Uh, sent him a message on the Instagram that said, hey, Mr. Georgie, how are you doing? I know you don't know me, but I do project management for flips. Managing the projects of your flips, hands-on, you don't need to do anything. I just do everything from start to the finish, turnkey service for you. And uh, he was open. So I was like, hey, let's meet up. So the first project that I gave him a price, I managed a whole flip for this guy. For, hmm. for just guess for how much. I won't. I won't guess. You tell me. Four hundred and fifty dollars. Oh wow! I just wanted to get the job. Of course, get in the door. Get in the door myself to see how how is it going to be working because at uh, all of these flips that I have done, I was the general manager of that company, so I wouldn't be 
answering to anybody kind of you know i was doing anything i want and right. as far as it was profitable that was fine but i wanted to see so how it's going to work when i'm working with somebody else's money private person doesn't know me and i'm not the employee of the company <laughs> i'm a 1099 which was a lot of things to learn you know so much stuff that i wasn't used to explain to people i learned that oh my god i have to explain so many stuff right because you were just a decision maker exactly exactly so the whole 2018 it was just a full learning experience for me to how to work with uh, investors, mm -hmm. different investors. And then um, at the end of 2018, January 2019, uh, I f finished the employment. We come to the agreement of just cutting the employment. And I went to on my own to just do my own ventures. I still work with that company that I used to be an employee, but uh, on just 1099 basis, uh, I do their listings sometimes. I do their rentals, uh, sales listings and stuff as a real estate agent. Good. I also have a company who does a maintenance call, like a handyman business, that I'm still doing the handyman business with my guys for that company, for all of those rentals that I bought one day myself. Mm. So we still do the business with them, but I don't do general management for them and just be on the payroll. Mm -hmm. So from 2019, I got my um, real estate license. And then um, my project management prices, they got adjusted the price to the real price that I have to charge. And then um, starting 2020, I stopped doing project management. So I only partner up with investors. Gotcha. So instead of managing the, managing it for a fee, I only partner up with them. Either either just partnering, if they put all the money, uh, I just do the do the work, or they put some of the money, I put uh, money also, and uh, we just depending on right contributions. That is such a fascinating and rapid trajectory from getting off a plane seven years ago. In Sam's Club. Did you see my photo? My I Facebook? did, I did. In fact, I think I might be able to... Let me see if I can show it. The one that I was cutting pizza, slicing pizza for yeah, people. Yeah, let, let me see if I can do this. Hold on a second. Um, I'll, I'll like to, I'd like to show this if I can. Um, oh, yeah, that's me. Yep. All right. You may want to click on that photo, probably. Yep. All right, I'm going to show people here. So this is Mohammed seven years ago in Sam's Club doing pizza sampling. <laughs> um, and um, it's just a fascinating, it's a fascinating trajectory that, that, that you had um, to go from doing that just a few years ago to where you're at now. Um, I think there's a lot to take to unpack there but tell me how did your experience before getting to the united states prepare you for that like did you know getting to the united states that this was it or were you just giving it a shot and if it didn't work you'd go elsewhere um for me it really doesn't comes to the idea of if it didn't work i don't see what is the reason that it shouldn't work for me because i'm so dedicated to whatever i want to do if if, if i want to if i decide to do something I don't un I don't take a no for it. Like there is no reason that why it should. You're not work. factoring that it's not going to work. You're no. just focusing on yeah. what you need to do to make it work. Yes. So it it definitely has to work. I'm I was never even thinking about it. That come to America to see how it goes. No. Yeah. I came to America for good. I know that. <coughs> excuse me. I know that I'm going to stay here and just move here. Um, my I would say yes, my previous experiences in the life, it, they were so helpful in different stage of my life in America. Because I used to, I, I have always have been so like greedy to be successful. It means that I was never happy kind of at the level of the success that I am. And I just wanted to go further and further. Back in, the, back in my country, I will tell you about the experiences that I had that they had nothing to do with each other. Unbelievable in different industries. Um, my major was computer science. So mm -hmm. for sure, I've graduated from the university. I started doing the computer business. And I find myself not so be interested 
even if I was graduated on the computer because it just it wasn't just me sitting on computer and write the software and just looking into the monitor all day. I, I'm a people's person. I need to meet people, talk right. to people. So I said, no, this is not going to work. And then I started working uh, with my dad. Uh, my dad used to have a, a brick factory. We were, we were producing bricks, mm-hmm. like a clay bricks, mm-hmm. because, you know, in uh, Iranian architecture, we use a lot of bricks and uh, we used to produce that. And I started with accounting, accounting for my dad and uh, doing all this like books and everything. And then I up- get upgraded to being a manager of the company. And my dad was letting me doing everything in the company. And then, um, you know, the manufacturing companies, they close early. We did, we did have like one shift, mm-hmm. shift that starts from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. And I wasn't ready to go home yet at 4 p.m., you know. Right. So, like, what should I do at 4 p.m. at the end of the day? This is, like, another half a day for me available. Yeah. So I started um, opening some coffee shops. And um, and this is still in Iran? It's still in Iran, yes. I, so I opened coffee shops that I can, at, at 4 p.m., I would just drive from the factory, my dad's factory, to, the, to my coffee shop. And the coffee shop was open all day, but... But it, it was someone my, else was working on it. Yes, yeah. and I was spending the whole night over there. My friends were coming. And so I was chatting out with my friends and making money Yeah, at the same time. And then I started another no- business, which was like a notary business. Uh, it's like, a, it's fun, uh, not a notary. It's like a, back in my country, DMV is private. Mm-hmm. So it's not a government DM- DMV. There are like offices, like notary offices that they do notary. They do... Uh, like, transferring yeah, titles. Like, like uh, common legal work. Yeah, and I used to own one of those offices also. Mm-hmm. And so I was doing all of these three businesses at the same time and working uh, uh, all time from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. So all of this experience of legal experience and uh, food experience and stuff, was mm-hmm. like even here on the Sam's Club photo, when they put me on that campaign, the first day I was brand new salesperson the first day that they put me on that campaign i was able to double their sales from 600 dollar a day i was selling 1200 dollar a day just because of different experience of people's experience and the coffee shop experience i know how to make it taste mm-hmm. better so uh, everything was working great and then during the sales business i was able to also help my general so, so that's I, that was my next question you ended up selling your coffee shops and all that Yes, I sold everything when I moved to America. I don't want to keep any bridge open. Yeah. To look yeah like, you know, it's funny because I don't know how many people um, see themselves doing what you did, but it's a common story among immigrants. Like, you know, you own businesses, you were successful by, you know, all definitions, and you decide to put your life in a suitcase and go to a foreign place and work, you know, in the kiosk at the Costco or the Sam's yeah. Club. And, you know, that's where you can see the real grit. And, I, th- you know, sometimes in the real estate industry, you see a lot of people, you know, especially on social media with like, oh, you got to hustle, work hard, this, that, and the other. And it's like, I don't know that a lot of people know what that is. Yeah, they, they don't understand the word, like the, the, the full definition of the hustle. Like it has like different shades. There's of levels hustle. to it. There's yes. levels to it, right? Yeah, There's yeah. levels to it. There's 50 shades of hustle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's funny cause when you made that post, you know, showing like your six year challenge, uh-huh. um, you know, it, it was it was touching because obviously it was genuine. I know you, I'm proud to know you. And, um, uh, and I, I think it was a really good thing for other people and other agents particularly to see to the, you know, this is what the real hustle looks like. Like if you want to get to the big leagues, this is what it looks like. Um, tell me, um, so you went from Iran to Dubai yes, and then to the United States from Dubai. How is Dubai? Cause everybody paints it like this glamorous, you mm. know, um, and I'm just curious what, what your experience was like. Uh, Dubai is a very, like, very interesting city to mm-hmm. experience, even uh, such as uh, either as a tourist or as a resident. Um, and it has like amazing, beautiful things happening in Dubai that you see beautiful buildings, like amazing places, everything like a different kind of experience, mm-hmm. which I mean, uh, stuff that you experience in Dubai, you, you may have never experienced them, such as. Um, this tallest building in the world that you just 
just standing by that tower and looking up. If you have any hat or something, it's going to fall from the back. Or if you have any sunglasses on your head, everything is going to fall back. Yeah. It's that big or that tall. Or these malls and everything that they build, they build it to another level. Yeah. That you say, whoa. But, um, yeah, and it's a small place. It's only like 12 square miles, which is like yeah. the size of Claremont, Florida. Mm-hmm. Don't people people don't understand that sometimes because it seems so grand, but in yes, like geogra- tiny. yeah, geographically speaking, it's a sm- very small um, slice mm-hmm. of space. Uh, and over the period of time, so you you may run out of the options of where you want to go, what you want to do. Something which bothers a little bit is um, the weather situation doesn't allow you to be always outside, which means you you should always be indoor. It's through the whole summer, maybe you, you can just walk outside sometimes. Oh, because it gets too hot. Hot, too hot, and too humid. So mm-hmm. it gets worse than Florida. It's few degrees high, hotter than Florida and way more humid than Florida. So it eliminates, uh, like, it very limits so much of your outdoor activities. Mm-hmm. Everything should be indoor. You want to play tennis, it's an indoor tennis. Everything is indoor kind of activities, except few months a year, like on January, February, March, probably you can get out and do some stuff but um something that i just it was a little bit bothering me in dubai was uh, the way that they pay um, the the workers over there so it's not that uh, you know in america for example because when i came to california i was trying to, uh, living in la and I was walking in Beverly Hills Boulevard and all of these beautiful areas. And you walk in Beverly Hills Boulevard and you see somebody is cleaning the street or, I don't know, there's a construction working over mm-hmm. there. You see the same glamorous thing in Dubai and you see the same worker over there. There's only one difference that nobody knows until they work, they leave there. That this guy in America pays fair price, is get paid fair price mm-hmm. because of American rules and the true democracy and freedom that is here, mm-hmm. you know? And they support everybody. This guy here, it's not get fair price in at Dubai. All. Yes, in Dubai. So they they get probably I don't know five hundred dollars maybe per month, and they have to send three hundred and fifty to their country and leave by one fifty. So yeah, so that's been one of the allegations, especially since they got the World Cup and they're like rushing to build in the UAE. They're rushing to build all the stadiums and all this infrastructure. Yeah. The amount of workers that have died because there's not like a whole mm-hmm. lot of rules for the safety of the workers and it's just like um it's like a machine that just turns people like it's yeah. not they just look at them and the, as the, like uh, items that the working items that which one which that one i think is is uh, the country of qatar yeah that's which is qatar. next to do yeah. but it's the same the yeah same, it's all part of the yeah. same uh, idea and then um another interesting thing that you see over there is if they hire for one position if they hire somebody from England, UK, they pay him an X amount of dollars or dirhams for the same position if they hire somebody from India or like any kind of like third world countries, they pay less. Of oh, course. <laughs> it's, it's just very funny theory. And they have their own justification what they why they do it. But they do some stuff behind the scene that y- it makes you not to be so proud to live there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, surely it's interesting because that's the stuff that you don't hear about. And, you know, you see people traveling and doing the, you know, it's, I equate it a lot, like when people travel to Cuba, you know, it's kind of like you don't, when you're doing tourism, you don't get to peek behind the curtain. You know, you just get the show that's in front of it, but you don't get to peek behind it and see how all of it is coming together. And, um, yeah, I've heard that about, the, you know, specifically in Dubai and Qatar and, you know, um, with the way they treat the workers and, Mm -hmm. and specifically it's funny because you you mentioned uh, sometimes with like the Indian workers, Pakistanis and stuff like that. I've, I've read about that too. It's, it's, they they feel a little bit discriminated. Well, they should feel right. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) They literally get paid less because of the place they were born in. (laughs) Exactly. But, uh, we need to also mention that like how much work they have done for this country, the the rulers of the country yeah. and this, the family who owns this, like uh, who do, who uh, rule Dubai and they rule like uh, the whole like um, UAE. Really, they changed the desert, uh, a desert 
my the wife, desert. Yeah, my uh, my fiance always tell me, baby, this is not dessert. That's desert. Dessert is what comes dessert after is, l- yeah, the meal, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are some still some American things yeah. that I confuse. So, uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, they made the desert appealing for people to go. Yeah. You know, and then for for their own people, it's great that how much their life is being changed and then how much they are working to change the culture of these people, you know. And and in in a relatively short time. I mean, because if you look at human history, you know, they've built um, this very impressive, very incredible um, place in a matter of a few decades. Mm -hmm. You know, this hasn't been there for hundreds of years. Yeah, exactly. So it's really, we have to, give value and credit to what they did for this country sure. and i'm so uh, excited to see how much they are working still to improve it and how much they are working on their people to the way that they think and how much they are becoming open-minded something that i love about like dubai and these countries is now that you know um, because of the conflict between israel and these arabic countries mm-hmm. So Israeli passport, they were not allowed to travel to these countries. So now it's getting more open, you know. Because I, I'm so against these stupid policies of not allowing any nationalities not to be able to travel to another country. Right. So now I see like uh, you, you see Israeli government officials, some people, they start traveling to Qatar, Dubai and this kind of stuff. And it's opening the door for this, uh, you know, to just for this region to be more peaceful region there's yeah. not really any uh, any reason behind why we shouldn't have because if if we have issues with israel for example for any reason th- we, we we need to meet them more yeah to to find out how we can solve the issue. yeah no alienate more but get together more often and figure yeah, it out right? by cutting the relationship nothing is gonna fix nothing is yeah. gonna you know it's not gonna get anywhere yeah and Obviously, now we got there with the conversation and today, it, you know, we are just a few days fresh of all the things that went in Iran um, and you made a post that got, became a little bit viral on Facebook about that. Yeah, I see people are sharing it. I yeah, people are sharing it now that um, just what was the post and let, I'll let you, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So what was the post and um, what were your feelings on it? So... Um for you know, when you are living back in United States, you know, living back in uh, Middle East, an American soldier means something different. But uh, but compared to the time that you are living in America, your front neighbor works in the army. She like he is in the navy, and or his wife also works in the navy, and he's deployed to Afghanistan and something. And you know them, you see them, uh, I hang out with them, they come to my backyard for a barbecue and stuff, you know. Then the definition of American soldier will change, you know. You'll see um, over there because of all this. It's always, unfortunately, in the world, most of the definition of stuff in the world is what media tells people. Right. They it's define. big problem. Yes, they define. So the same issue that we have in America with the media that uh, they just manipulate the minds. It's the same issue all over the world. So back in Middle East, um, people, they don't so much probably care about an American soldier in, in the Middle East. You know, they don't understand that how scary it is for somebody to go from all the way from America to be stationed in the middle of Iraq or Afghanistan or anywhere for uh, any reason. You know, some people, they have financial reasons that they do it. Some people, they have, uh, you know, national reasons. They, they yeah, people people become become the personification of a definition that extracts the humanity out of them. Because yeah. these are humans. These are normal human people mm-hmm. that have a job that requires them, unfortunately, to go halfway across the world. Yeah. But the way they see them over there is not kind of removes the humanity out of it it's what you're saying it's you're you're a soldier so now you're this other thing yeah they just look at the soldiers are just machines that are coming from another country they don't see them as human beings you know right and that's the you know the main con- concept of the war that it will eliminate you being able to see the real side of the end yeah it's us versus them yeah exactly so i was you know it bothers me that uh you know, my government makes some decisions, like most of their decisions, uh, 
they have their own agenda they have their own criteria my government i'm not talking about referring to iranian government yeah that it makes uh it's really unnecessary so much of stuff that they do that it will require the other countries to have presence in the region to just control the area and i'm not really a supporter of uh american press like pre- like having american troops all the way all in the middle east because mm-hmm. it's not really we don't want to get so much deep into it it's not really it's even america is not just about uh, oh we are all here to just have some peace they have their own benefits also of sure. being there because if they are not there then the russia is going to be there or china is going to be there so there is a space that needs to be occupied by either Russia, China, or uh, mm-hmm. America. So that's why Americans are occupying that for for now. Uh, but the the idea of these um, issues that okay, so they assassinated this guy Soleimani, and now for sure the go- Iranian government wants to take revenge of them. And we are talking about assassinating one person, but I'm not sure the Iranian government is going to be thinking about assassinating one American general. Right. Because it's either going to be, I don't know, so hard. And let, and let me ask you, because one of the things that you see, and it's so confusing, because I'd say this. So, you know, it used to be that you could get kind of like parse the wheat from the shaft, you know, by looking at social media a little bit, but it's, it's so polluted now that you don't know where the right information is. But what, was he generally looked at as like, what they're saying like this revered war hero general inside the country or is that just a a small percentage of the population maybe the loudest percentage of the population or like what do you think most people viewed him as um before attacking before attack by trump or after Before, yeah, well, that's a that's, a <laughs> that's a valid point because when people die, they become yes. heroes. Yes, suddenly everybody become heroes yeah. when they get uh, killed by America. Yeah. You know, they just become heroes. Uh, so the idea is that this uh, this guy Soleimani, as um, yeah, and you know, I'm not a politician, or I'm not so uh, expert into this, but as far as I know about this Middle East, uh, he has done so many great stuff. To the region by uh, fighting against ISIS. Mm-hmm. At the same time, he has done so many crazy stuff also uh, in Syria, in Iraq, in um, in my country to mm, fight against any kind of uh, opposition, oppositions of the government. Mm-hmm. The oppositions of my government, they just uh, shut them down. You know, like uh, quite literally. Like uh, a month ago, we had uh, some protest back in my country about uh, the fuel prices started rising up s- tremendously, and people they rushed into the street and they were all like having yeah, like riots, riots, and it, they were not doing so crazy stuff. They were just yeah. like demonstrating, and uh, they killed about one hundred and fifty, two hundred and fifty of them. Yeah, which is of our own people right. by our own government. Yeah, you know. So and these people are behind it, you know. They did the same thing to Syrian people. You know, there was oppos- uh, like a war inside Syria and, like, you know, uh, some rebels, they call everybody, everybody who are against the government seems like now they call it terrorist. Yeah. If you are against the government, you are terrorist. Yeah. It's a it, new thing. Yeah, it, it's funny because the Venezuelan government sort of does the same thing, same you know, thing, like, like everyone is a terrorist everybody if you disagree with them yeah. in any way, shape or form. So you don't, you are surrounded by terrorists. In fact, they, they, there's, there was a, in Venezuela, there was a presidential candidate that uh, ended up going to prison. He was an opposition leader. He ended up, they put him in prison for um, instigating terrorism. I'm like... <laughs> It never existed when I was a child. And like th- these are in- internal terrorism, not yeah. terrorism from another country. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Our people are terrorism yeah. right now. So yeah, they were doing the same thing. They were like, um, you know, shutting down all of these opposition forces in uh, in Syria. Whoever was against Syrian government and this uh, General Soleimani was having a strong role over there. At some point, he even uh, went to Russia to talk to mm-hmm. Vladimir Putin and get their help. And that's that's when. They put an end on this uh, Syrian... Yeah, it appears war. he was a, a, a heavy-handed military strategist. Yeah, he's an architect of all of these uh, 
proxy stuff. groups. Yeah. Pro- plus, he's the architect of the proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Yeah. You know, Iran and Saudi Arabia, usually they don't get into head to head with each other, but they usually have these proxy things going on in the region. And this guy was the architect of all of this. So, not necessarily the way that American thinks. Not necessarily he has like let uh, any terrorist activities against America. They don't have anything to do with it. They, they mostly he was involved with whoever is against my government, whoever is against Syrian government, who is against uh, Iraqi government, because these governments are backed by my but by, by Iranian government. Yeah. You know? So he was he's more focusing on those. Plus, yes, the Americans shouldn't be in the Middle East. That's what he's yeah. taught. You know. Yeah. So not necessarily, I would say, he was so much involved with killing Americans, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't say he was a, also a great person. Yes, he was involved with killing so many other people. Yeah. Know? But even Iranians... Even though they do, one of the things that they allege about him is that he uh, he was the architect behind like the IEDs that they used in Iraq and Afghanistan, like those roadside bombs that killed a bunch of americans that so, yeah i don't know about that you yeah know? Alleg- allegedly it was his idea um and those were kind of like manufactured in iran and then you know shipped over to whoever you know whoever the guerrilla groups were in iraq and afghanistan the taliban or whatever that were fighting americans and you know the, in the, the way that the media works is like because for example they are manufactured in this country whatever action happens, they put it on the Iranians, but yeah. it's just like the same thing that when Americans, they sell billions of dollars of armo of, of arms to, to Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Arabia. Yeah. So, so is America killed that guy in Turkey? Yeah. The, uh, whatever the, yeah, that the, guy? the reporter guy. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was, you know, is it was killed by American guns. So America killed, you know, it's, yeah. it's a long yeah, story. We're, yeah. We're, and it's funny because I always, I think about that sometimes with, um, I always think it's funny because people talk about appropriating culture, you know, like that's a thing like, you know, and I always say like, well, depends how far back you go. Right. Because like there was no tomatoes in Italy a couple of hundred years ago. <laughs> they are not indigenous to the area, but we think about tomato sauce now and we think about Italy. So yeah. like the, did, did they appropriate it, appropriate it from someone? Like, if you go far back enough in history, you can basically find responsibility to anything to anyone because everything is so intertwined now. That yeah, but uh, most imp- interesting part is even the Iranians, the people of Iran, that they are suffering from whatever is happening in their country from this government, and they have been suffering for the last 40 years because of the stupid decisions that this government is making. Uh, even... When I don't know what is inside their mind is like lack of education. Sometimes I can say that w- since Trump ordered assassinating this guy, now this guy becomes like a saint. Mm-hmm. Like they totally forget that hey, you were under the pressure of the same guy. Your cousin was shot dead inside the, in, in on the streets because of these orders of these guys. Yeah, you know? they killed, they killed two hundred of your people a month ago. No, I don't know if you see on the news or not. There are like rumors that even that Ukrainian airplane that take off. Oh, they confirmed that right before you came in. It's funny because I got the alert. Like there are rumors that it has been shot. By so a, now they have the satellite imagery that it was shot down by mistake by, or whatever. Yeah, you know, and again, that's something that a lot of people won't relate to. But one of the things that happens sometimes in third world countries is that you have unprepared people in high power positions that are rarely used Mm -hmm. that guy that's reading those radars that guy that has his finger on the button he has a job to you know someone told him if you see any american aircraft on the space you shoot him out of the sky and his finger was trembling and he saw this thing on the radar and he wasn't sure and he said ah fuck yeah and he you know, took out an airliner with 180 people. And it, it just it just took off from the capital of, uh, of Iran. It's yeah, of like so weird. Like, how come we just take off and nobody knows that we are next to the airport? Well, it, it, the thing is that it happened. It's funny because it, this is unfolding live. And I'm like, I, I'm fascinated by foreign um, situations. And I like politics. I'm always like looking at Twitter or whatever. And so when this is going on was... It was in the evening, my daughter's already in bed and I'm like following everything. And the second Iran launched their 15 rockets, literally 30 minutes later, there was people in Twitter posting about this plane 
that had been go- that had gone down. I'm like, that plane had got hit by a rocket. By a rocket. How, what yeah. are the chances? Like, what are the chances you have these 15 rockets flying out? 2016 airplane, like yeah. a new airplane. Yeah, a new airplane right over Tehran at the same time. Someone was told not to let any American aircraft on the airspace. They were nervous. They saw this thing and they hit a button that they shouldn't have. Yeah. But that's what happens when you have like unprepared people and then they have the fear of retribution from their own government, I think. Because whoever that person is that hit that button, you know that if he doesn't hit the button and ends up being an American bomber over Tehran for whatever yeah. reason, mm-hmm. that guy is dead. Like that guy doesn't yeah. get to to... He doesn't get reprimanded for his mistake consequences are high the consequences are too high and y- i don't know if you're aware or not but uh, unfortunately the same thing happens to almost like 20 years ago i believe yeah the persian gulf yeah the navy i think americans they hit iranian airliner who was going from iran to dubai and they hit them on the persian gulf they thought is a war plane yeah well i mean and this is the second time within a couple of years because the Malaysian plane that the Russians took down, yeah. mm-hmm. same sort of thing. You have a bunch of 26-year-olds in a field, jacked with testosterone. Yes. Tensions are high. They're telling them they're going to war. They see this plane and they hit the button and it ends up being a very grave mistake. So um, we are going to see what's going to happen soon. But hopefully everything is going to a little bit like cool down now in the region, Hope I hope. Yeah, you know what I hope? You know what I hope this will all was? My, my hope is that I think this general had a lot of power and everybody says he had the military in his pocket for yeah. sure in Iran and that he almost had too much power where he was getting a little too crazy with the embassy stuff with the United States and shooting down a drone and with the internal problems in Iran my hope is someone within the Iran government said this guy is going to become a problem for us and it's not like you can ask him to retire like you can't fire a general you know yeah. and Maybe they said to the Americans, hey, here's a token of appreciation. Our, like an agreement. Yeah. Um, you take him out and so you get that win and then our country unifies because they'll see you as the offender, not us. And so like it's, yeah, it's a win-win situation. It's a win-win win situation, which is a very rare thing that happens between, you know, the Middle East and the Western world. And even see the rockets that they throw at uh, America, the 15 or yeah. whatever. They, they also hit the dirt. Uh, they they hit all of the ba- the bases, yeah. but uh, they in, intentionally they targeted the the places that they used to they used to like to hold these aircraft, yeah. you know, no residential building or something. Right. And they gave five hour notice to Iraqi government that we are going to hit these areas. And, right. Uh, okay. Okay. Like yeah, it's almost it's funny because I, so I I was talking to some of my friends about it, and I'm like, when have you ever seen this? When have yeah. you ever seen? A situation where like you know the western world and the middle east is at odds with each other they're firing at each other and except the general and the people that happen to be in the in the truck at the airport in in iraq like everything else misses and then after they shoot the rockets the iranian um, government is like we have concluded our yes, retaliation yes. like we have concluded we like, stepping down yeah it's like what that's that's very strange. Yeah, like that Trump doesn't... with all of the stuff that he was saying, then he he is, he didn't even re- retaliated after it. It's yeah, just behind the scenes of this. Stuff. Yeah, but who knows? One thing that we always know, I think, is uh, the war in the Middle East and this like in this tiny like internal war. All any kind of this conflicts in the Middle East is never gonna uh, go away. I I would say for never because this is the main region that they have oil. They have the money and they have the power to buy the armors and buy all of this technology war, you know, uh, arms and everything from these countries. Either buying them from China, Russia, Germany, America. So I think the benefit, the financial benefit of all these countries is in having always some kind of conflict in this region. Yeah. So they can be present, plus they can... Their presence can be paid. Yeah, my hope is like, my favorite part about what they've done in the UAE with Dubai and Qatar and these countries is that my hope is like, the next generation in Iran, you know, that are seeing their grandfather, you know, do whatever they've been doing in Iran since 1979, 
that they look at Qatar and they go, man, they're, they're driving around Bugattis and Lamborghinis and traveling in private jets. Like, I want that. I don't want to be in the back of a Toyota pickup with a fucking AK-47. Like, that's my hope because that's one thing that Dubai has done. It's, it's kind of opened the eyes. You know, you see it a little bit with the next generation in Saudi Arabia, even though, you know, it's always... This stuff has taken hundreds of years to get here. It's not going to get fixed in six months. But my hope is that going forward that the next generations are more interested in like, hey, man, we, we want to drive Ferraris and party too. We don't want this. Like we, you know, this whole militia lifestyle is not, you know, it, it's not sustainable for the well-being of a nation of 80 million people. Like, um, You see it happening in Saudi Arabia that they are starting to be more open-minded and yeah. uh, the new the the um, this new uh, Mohammed bin Salman the guy yeah. who is like the the son of the king you know he's he's becoming more softer he's like he has bright newer ideas and more open-minded now they are letting l- women to drive they are letting them come to yeah and so people listen to that and I you know people are like well it was about time and the thing is like Yes, but also don't minimize what that means in the grand scheme of things for progress. Like, mm-hmm. he could have not done that too, you know, but yeah. he did. So yeah. that's a good step in the yeah, right direction. You need to give them the credit for whatever they are doing because it's not an easy thing to do. Of course. Especially in like a, that uh, environment like Saudi Arabia. Is, what he is doing is not that easy. He has to go step over so many people. He has to fight with so many ideologies to be able yeah. to do it. And uh, they really need to get the credit for it. Like, they're doing a great job. Good. Well, I'll give all the credit right now to you, man, because your story is amazing. Thank um, you. you. are a pleasure to talk to, and I can't wait to talk to you again in a couple of years, see where you're at, all right? Because uh, next time I'm going to come with Mila, my fiance, because now we are teaming up together, and me and her, and we are doing... Uh, uh, our own YouTube. I don't know if you ever see our own I, YouTube I ha- channel. I have a little bit, but you know, tell people how they can find your YouTube channel so they can see some of the shows, the episodes that you're doing with Mila. Yeah, so you know, Mila does uh, home staging and she's an interior designer. So uh, I started uh, teaming up with with her on my Philips. So she does takes care of instead of me going picking up tile and colors and stuff. She just uh, does everything. And then um, the name of the channel that we posted, the YouTubes about our flips is Fixer Upper Realtor. Fixer Upper Realtors. Fixer Upper Realtors. Yeah. Mohammed, thank you very much, buddy. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.